When the residents of a home in the tranquil neighborhood of Forest Hills, Queens, examined their Nest home surveillance footage from the previous evening, they couldn't possibly have guessed that the shadowy images it captured of a man walking through the darkness of their residential street would turn out to become one of the most haunting and disturbing scenes ever caught on video. It was a horrific scene here in Queens after a woman's body was found inside of a duffel bag earlier today. Police have just identified the victim and now investigators are asking anyone with information to call them. Welcome to Fear Files, where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying, and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Before we get started, we would like to send our thoughts and prayers to the loved ones of Orsolia Gall who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. This story takes us to the quiet upscale neighborhood of Forest Hills, a mostly residential neighborhood in the borough of Queens, New York City. With its tree-lined streets and Tudor-style homes, sweet shops and old-school Italian pizza parlors, Forest Hills is often thought of as a neighborhood reminiscent of days gone by. Big city problems have bypassed Forest Hills. Crime rates are low, the streets are safe, and parks are in ample supply. But in the spring of 2022, the quiet city oasis was about to be upended in the most horrific way imaginable. On the morning of April 16, 2022, 911 operators received a call about a suspicious-looking bag that lay discarded on a stretch of road in the Kew Gardens neighborhood of Queens. The large black sports bag, the caller said, appeared to be leaking blood across the pavement. Before officers from the NYPD had time to respond, a second call came in, this time about an even grislier discovery. 51-year-old Glenn Van Nordstrand had been returning from walking his dog in the morning around 8 a.m. when he noticed a large wheeler bag strewn across the grass and adjacent sidewalk near the corner of Metropolitan Avenue and Jackie Robinson Parkway. Glenn had often seen trash and other discarded items along the busy roadside, but there was something about this particular bag that troubled him. As he drew closer, his dogs became agitated. Soon, both were straining at their leads. It wasn't until Glenn was virtually standing over the bag that he saw why. Blood was leaking from the bottom of the bulky Bauer bag and trickling across the concrete sidewalk. Glenn had seen his fair share of crazy things in Forest Park over the years and plenty of dead animals. Figuring the bag contained the remains of a dead animal, he nudged the side of it with his leg. It was heavy. He leaned down and pulled open the bag's zipper. Later, he told a reporter, I just saw this pair of bare feet, pale, bare feet, and I thought, oh my gosh. Stunned, Glenn wondered if what he was seeing was part of a mannequin or some kind of crash test dummy. The skin looked hard, not fleshy at all. He unzipped the bag further. Now he could see legs clad in black jeans, a belt and the lower portion of a female waist. The bag, he soon realized, contained the entire body of a woman who lay headfirst in the bag, curled into the fetal position. At 8.02 a.m., Glenn called 911. The horror of what he had seen hit him like a freight train. I felt quite choked up, he said. I honestly thought the body was that of a teenage girl because it seemed so small. Emergency services soon surrounded the scene. The NYPD were familiar with this stretch of road. In recent years, several bodies had been dumped at this secluded spot. Like many others, this victim's body had no form of ID and no way of knowing who she was. Only, Glenn was about to change that. He crossed over Metropolitan Avenue and noticed another streak of blood. Glenn alerted police. Soon, they had uncovered an entire trail of blood that extended a half a mile, or nine blocks, all the way from the location of the blood-soaked duffel bag through the leafy streets of Forest Hills and right to the side door of a $2 million home on Juno Street. 
Outside the house at 7224 Juno Street, a squad of officers from the NYPD prepared to make an emergency entry into the house. Once inside, a quick search revealed blood on the first floor and the basement of the home, and a blood-stained knife. On the third floor, they found 13-year-old Leo Klein. He appeared to have just woken up. When questioned by police, Leo said that he lived at the house with his parents and his 17-year-old brother, Jamie. His father was away in Oregon with his brother, and he didn't know where his mother was. Leo was handcuffed on the spot and led out to a waiting police vehicle, then driven to the nearest police precinct. Glenn Van Nordstrand, the dog walker who had stumbled upon the blood-soaked hockey bag, was already at the precinct giving his statement when police brought Leo in. Glenn claimed that Leo was dragged around the station handcuffed. The teen was wearing no shoes. He appeared to still be in his pajamas. After being questioned without the presence of an adult, officers determined that Leo had no knowledge of the crime and released him into the custody of a relative. Police, meanwhile, had confirmed the identity of the body in the bag. It was the body of 51-year-old Orsolia Gall, Leo's mother. Leo had learned of his mother's gruesome homicide while being accused of her murder. A forensic examination of Orsolia's body revealed that her throat had been cut. She had suffered 58 stab wounds to her torso, neck, and arms, and defensive wounds to her palms and fingers. The city's medical examiner would later state that her death was a homicide owing to sharp force injuries of the neck. Our lives will not be the same neither, mm -hmm. because every time I would come out, I would hear her mm -hmm. or the dog the barking. Dog. She was a very happy woman, mm -hmm. always smiling, yeah. always joking. And loved life. She, yeah. she loved life, really. Yeah. The savage nature of the murder and the sloppy way in which her body had been dumped, leaving a trail of DNA evidence, were strongly indicative of a crime of passion. The pure ferocity of the attack itself was a classic case of overkill, indicating a level of personal rage unlikely to be found in a stranger. Dr. Michael Bodden, a physician and medical examiner, said of the investigation, they know it's more than just an acquaintance. It's someone who really hated that person. It could be a husband, sometimes a child. One son had been ruled out. Orsolia's husband and eldest son, meanwhile, had both been out of town at the time of her murder, scouting potential colleges in Oregon for the 17-year-old Jamie. But this didn't absolve them of any involvement, and residents of a home on 75th Avenue, Forest Hills, had just provided police with a horrifying new piece of evidence. A Nest home surveillance camera from a home not far from Orsolia's had caught a shadowy figure rolling a large bag through the dark streets of Forest Hills at about 4.30 a.m. in the morning of April the 16th. Inside that bag, detectives now knew, was in all likelihood the butchered remains of Orsolia Gall. But who was the mysterious person dragging the bag? Her body was found in a duffel bag not far from her Forest Hills home. CBS 2's Elijah Westbrook has a reaction and more on the investigation. I got the goosebumps. For some neighbors, there's just no other way to describe it. it feels like something out of TV. It's just really, it's rough. Sadness looms over this Forest Hills neighborhood following the death of 51-year-old Orsalia Gall, a wife and mom of two sons found dead on Metropolitan Avenue near the Jackie Robinson Parkway. Out of all places, a duffel bag, according to police. It's scary and... Uh... I don't understand how somebody can do this. Police say a man walking his dog spotted the duffel bag on the side of the roadway Saturday morning shortly after 8 o'clock. The scenic and well-groomed street Gall lived on with her family not far from where she was found dead is now the location of a crime scene. Police tape still surrounds the entrance to her home and flowers placed by those she knew sit on a tree out on the sidewalk. The disturbing death leaving some with more questions than answers. You keep reliving the, the sequence of events as how does this happen. So it's actually quite strange. The more it goes on, the more it's like the gravity of the situation just keeps making it worse. 
And why someone would do this still remains a mystery at this hour. Police continue to look for the person responsible for killing Gall. Orsolia Gall had lived in Forest Hills with her husband, Howard Klein, and sons Leo and Jamie for nearly a decade. A native of Hungary, Orsolia had met Howard at a Christmas party in Budapest in 1994. The 23-year-old Orsolia had recently finished her studies at a Budapest Business School's College of International Management and Business. 25-year-old Howard was about to begin a master's in finance at Columbia Business School. For several weeks, the two exchanged love letters before holidaying together in Thailand. When Howard returned to New York to begin his studies, he invited Orsolia to join him. And she never left. Howard had gone on to found a successful boutique capital markets advisory firm. Orsolia had worked for several years in Manhattan before putting her career on hold to raise the couple's two sons. On August 2, 2012, the family had moved into their five-bedroom home in Forest Hills. Friends and family described Orsolia as someone who loved life. She was sociable and extremely friendly, people said. Someone who was always smiling, joking, and ready for a laugh or a chat. She was an avid traveler. Orsolia's Facebook profile overflows with photos from family trips to Paris, China, and Tokyo. But her greatest joy in life came from her sons, her friends said, with whom she was attentive and loving. From the outside, at least, Orsolia appeared to be the perfect picture of a happily married mother. But the outside, as we all know, is never the whole picture. When police confirmed in the press that Orsolia's husband and son were persons of interest, all eyes turned to Orsolia's husband. Howard Klein had been on the other side of the country with their eldest son, Jamie, at the time of Orsolia's murder, purportedly checking out potential colleges before his upcoming graduation. On the morning of Friday, April 15th, Howard had posted on his Twitter account that they had arrived in Portland at 1.36 a.m. Oregon time on April 16th. Howard posted another, now-deleted, tweet saying that they were on their way home to New York. The early flight seemed to be in response to a harrowing message Howard had received from his wife's phone in the early hours of that morning. The message read, your wife sent me to jail some years ago when you were living near Austin Street in Forest Hills. I'm back. Don't call the police, or I will kill your family. Soon afterwards, Howard would receive a call from police that his wife's butchered body had been found near Forest Park. In the meantime, he would reportedly tell the Post newspaper that there were concerns for his family's safety, and they were at risk. Huh? Who are you? Who New are York you? Post. What is? What are you? What are you doing? No, seriously, what are you doing? Why, why are you photographing me? Why are you this photographing my job. me? You're not taking my credentials. Yeah, I want to take your, I want to see your credentials. I want to take pictures You're, of your you credentials. You can see my credentials. Yeah, now I want to see, I want to take pictures of both. Okay. Okay. No, what are you doing? No, what are you doing? You, what are you, doing? You, you can't touch me. Why are you if you privacy? touch me, if you Why touch you me, I'm going to call the police. Okay. If you touch me, I'm going to okay. call the police. Yes, I'd like to know your name. My I'd name like is Robert. Name. Howard's every move now came under intense scrutiny. Social commentators, including Nancy Grace, piled on with questions over his Twitter posts. They stuck out as unusual, she said, and smacked of someone trying to prove they had an alibi. As for the message from his wife's phone, it had a John Bonet Ramsey vibe, she said, a cliched threat that sounded like something from a bad film. And what kind of murderer would take the time to send a text? Also against him was the fact that there were no signs of forced entry at the house. Orsolia must have known her killer, or that person had used a spare key, commonly known to be hidden in the barbecue on the property. The killer, it seemed, had also been in the house for hours, another factor that pointed towards the killing being someone who knew Orsolia well, or was a member of the family, even. And there was something else strange, too. Orsolia had been reported missing by her husband once before after going for a midnight stroll. 
Howard had called 911 to report his wife missing at around 7.21 a.m. on May the 29th, 2020, but he called back 30 minutes later to say that she had been found. The incident echoed an earlier and equally strange occurrence in 2004 when her son had been reported missing at the age of 10 months, also by Howard. Meanwhile, police were combing through phone records, surveillance videos, and receipts from the places Orsolia had visited that night, trying to piece together her final movements in the hours before her death. Orsolia had told neighbors on Friday, April 15th, that she was heading into Manhattan that evening to see an opera at the Lincoln Center with some friends. An examination of her phone, however, revealed a different story. Orsolia had been communicating with three different men on the night of her murder. It was with one of those men that Orsolia had gone to the concert with at Lincoln Center. All three were now under investigation. By 11 p.m. that night, Orsolia was back in the Forest Hills area. She had come home on the train alone and then stopped by the Forest Hill Station House Bar, where she often went for a drink or food after a night out. She was friendly with the manager, Gabe Varus. Police believe Orsolia arrived home at 12.20 a.m. Her attacker had entered shortly after, sometime before 12.40 a.m. By 4.30 a.m., the killer was wheeling Orsolia's body away in her son's hockey bag. And the killer? A curious note on Orsolia's refrigerator would help point the way. The note simply said, Find a new handyman. Of the three men with whom Orsilia had been communicating on the night she was murdered, one was a man who had been doing odd jobs at the Juno residence for the past two years. That man was 44-year-old David Bonola, a so-called heating and air conditioning repairman. Bonola was a married father of two who had illegally entered the United States from Mexico 21 years earlier and, according to his social media, was an aspiring filmmaker and a graduate of the New York School of Interior Design. By the time of Orsolia Gall's murder, Bonola had become estranged from his wife and children and was living in an apartment in nearby Richmond Hill. Those who frequented the area near his 114th Street home described him as a night owl who played guitar and was often seen riding his bike after dark, stopping at a local 7-Eleven for junk food. It was soon clear to police from the nature of the messages on Orsolia's phone that soon after taking on work at the Juno Street home, the relationship between Orsolia and Bonola had turned physical. Benola had been leaving comments on Orsolia's Facebook photos. On a picture of her in Guatemala in April of 2019, Benola wrote, Love those streets and architecture, that landscape and the giant volcano, and you, followed by a heart emoji. In July 2019, Benola wrote, She is the most beautiful woman. And in May 2020, Tu mirada enamorada which translates roughly to your look of love. Given her situation, it's hard to imagine that Orsolia would have appreciated Benola's comments, but this would turn out to be just his opening gambit when it came to Benola's depravity. Martin Calixto, the owner of a florist shop across the street from Benola's home, said Benola used to stop by his store nightly to buy a single red rose. Benola showed him photos of Orsolia, whom he claimed to be in love with. But Calixto hadn't seen Benola in the last 12 months. Police, meanwhile, knew that Orsolia had ended things with Benola in early April of 2022, just weeks before her murder. Benola had been on their radar ever since. Perhaps his history of harassment also helped to alert them to his potential as a stalker turned murderer. 21 year old Oliwa Pikulinski had worked for three years as a barista at the Starbucks in Forest Hills where Benola was a regular. Benola, she said, was creepy. He stalked people. Everyone knew he was a weird individual. The 44-year-old spent long periods of time at the Austin Street Starbucks several times a week, 
where he would openly watch the baristas while they worked, commenting on their appearances, propositioning them, and leaving love notes in their tips jar. He was even deluded enough to propose marriage to two of them. Several employees called the police and on more than one occasion, but Benola simply left before the police arrived. But it was his passion for YouTube that would shine the real light into Benola's deepest thoughts and desires. Two themes stood out, seduction and violence. Benola had created his own YouTube channel, but it wasn't for creating content, just collecting it. Benola had collected thousands of videos, all carefully organized into vast playlists. One playlist contained 750 local news reports detailing violent crimes in the area, rapes, murders, and shootings, presumably to play on loop and study. Then there were the videos on sex and women, the general gist of which were simplistic tips for picking up women and seducing them. One playlist contained over 200 videos, all in the same vein of how to develop mindsets that attract women like crazy. It's fair to say that, in sum, Benola was an obsessive fantasist with a serious stalker tendency and a child's understanding of dating and a fascination with violent crime. When police maintained that they had no suspects in the case, they had been closely monitoring Benola and his home. At 6.05 a.m. on the morning of the murder, a surveillance camera on 114th Street not far from Benola's Richmond apartment had captured Benola walking with a makeshift white bandage wrapped around his left hand. Later that same day, Benola had gone to a city MD for help with cuts on his hands and had been sent to Bellevue Hospital after doctors said the wounds were too deep for them to treat. Police had now waited days for the trash to be picked up. They wanted to recover and go through it without waiting for a search warrant. That trash would be Benola's undoing. Amongst his garbage, they found brown boots soaked in blood, allegedly worn by Benola while he stabbed Orsolia nearly 60 times, along with a blood-stained t-shirt and bloody bandages. On Wednesday, April 19th, NYPD detectives returned to the neighborhood to search for David Benola, who had reportedly spotted them first. Benola approached a squad car and reportedly said, I hear you're looking for me. Police immediately transported him to the NYPD's 112th precinct, where he made a startlingly frank confession to the murder of Orsolia Gall. He paused to eat a bagel before repeating the confession once more on videotape for the prosecution. Bonolo told police that he and Orsolia had been involved in an on-again, off-again relationship for two years. Orsolia had recently broken things off again, and Bonola had gone to her house in the early morning hours of April 16th in an attempt to make amends. But the conversation had become heated, and Orsolia had led Benola down to the basement to avoid waking her son Leo. The argument had escalated further, causing Benola to fly into a rage. He'd grabbed a knife and slit Orsolia's throat, he said, before stabbing her repeatedly. Then, not wanting her son to discover his mother's slain body, he placed the body in the boy's hockey bag, eventually dumping it outside in Forest Park. Benola also admitted to sending the ominous message to her husband, threatening to kill the rest of the family. But there were inconsistencies in Benola's account. For instance, did he already have a knife from Orsolia's kitchen on him when the fight broke out in the basement? The following day, David Benola revised his confession. He had gone to Orsolia's house after discovering that she had given him HIV, he said, an STD she had contracted during multiple infidelities. She'd also recently taken calls from another man and had plans to see him, something that Benola said he just could not accept. Orsolia then grabbed the knife and told him repeatedly to leave the home, quote, or she would kill him. 
At that point, he had grabbed the knife from her and cut her throat. The small amount of blood found in the area casts serious doubts on this claim, however. While the extensive blood found in the basement lends credence to Benola's first account, one he would understandably prefer to negate given the element of planning it introduces to the crime. On April 20th, David Benola was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, first-degree criminal tampering, and fourth-degree criminal possession of a weapon. He has pleaded not guilty, despite having confessed to the murder twice. If convicted, Benola faces a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. District Attorney Melinda Katz said, This heinous murder left two teenagers without a mother and terrified an entire community. With the trial pending and the investigation ongoing, no information has yet been released on any of Benola's claims, from the HIV status of either Benola or Orsolia to his motive for the crime. But that's not difficult to deduce. He stated it in his first confession. Orsolia had plans to meet another man, something he just could not accept. Meanwhile, in the court of public opinion, Orsolia Gall has been repeatedly held as at least partially, if not fully, responsible for her own grisly demise simply by virtue of either her adultery or poor taste in men. Conversations have followed threads along these lines. When we have families, there's a certain obligation that we don't put ourselves at risk. Joseph Giacoloni, a retired NYPD detective and current professor at John Jay College in Brooklyn, has been openly critical of what he feels has been the shaming of Orsolia Gall by the media and public. Giacoloni said, What I read about is a lot of victim blaming. She got involved in an extramarital affair. Everything we do in life comes with consequences, but murder should never be the consequence. At Orsolia's memorial service, her older son, Jamie, speaking for him and his younger brother, Leo, said that his mother found happiness in our happiness. When I think about my mom, I think about all the work she put into raising us. She had a passion for making her kids happy. She found happiness in our happiness. Right now, that's what's important to remember. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. If you've got a case you'd like to see given more coverage, drop us a line in the comments. And thank you for your support. We are grateful for every one of our subscribers. So, until next time, Stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.